This is a University of Otago podcast. We have an hour and a half coming up of present presentations. Three presentations in all. Each of them has been allocated 30 minutes. And each person will essentially use that 30 minutes in the way they wish to. For the most part, it will be, you know, a mixture of presentation and an opp opportunity for you to ask questions or to, to engage in some sort of discussion. So each time I'll just, it, just invite the presenter to come up and um, we'll just go for it. So our first presenter... Oh, I've already seen, except I haven't seen Diane. <laughs> okay, so... Our first presenter is Associate Professor Tim Cooper from the Department of Theology and Religion. And Tim's presentation is, as it says on there, five years on, our blended learning model. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you all. Um, I arrived at the University of Otago 12 years ago and uh, into uh, the Department of Theology and Religion. I teach church history and it was a distance program, and I am extremely grateful for that. Uh, I would not be the teacher that I am today without the distance teaching, uh, because it confronted me with a real challenge. Uh, I've got this group of students, and I've got that group of students, and they're going to sit the same assessment. How do they learn? And it was working out that challenge that changed my teaching uh, from the ground up. So it's, you know, it's been a brilliant experience. It's also been a brilliant experience because my colleague is Professor Paul Trebilko, and uh, I am delighted to uh, embarrass him um, <coughs> uh, and, and honour him. I mean, it, there is no better colleague than, than Paul. Uh, you will, if you know Paul, you'll be aware of his, his, his gracious style, his leadership, his vision, uh, just brilliant to work with. So uh, I am extremely grateful for the experience that I've had uh, and continue to have at Otago. Uh, I'm going to talk about our, our, our new model, which is not so new anymore. Um, first of all, I'm going to describe what we changed, and then I'm going to evaluate it five years on. Uh, we basically ushered in this new model in 2011, and in, at the 2011 distance learning symposium, I gave a presentation on it. So it kind of made sense, you know, today to revisit that and say, well, how is it looking five years on? I'm aware that that's a little bit risky because it's not the New Zealand way to draw attention to one's success, all right? Uh, it's the American way, I think, but it's not the New Zealand way. Uh, and so I don't the risk is that this comes across as a little bit self-serving um, because the basic message is that we're very pleased with our new model. Uh, it seems to be working well. Um, but hopefully, you know, this whole thing is in the nature of a celebration, 30 years. Um, so, look, there's just a touch of celebration around it, all right? So let me explain um, what we had uh, for a start. So basically, not to diminish it, but our old model essentially was video, uh, audio conferences uh, and a course book. So the student would be sent the course book, hard copy. Uh, there would be around seven uh, audio conferences in the semester, and that was the way that we taught by distance. Our, our new model was what we called a blended learning model, and it, it, we move, we're able to move to video conferencing just because the technology stepped up a notch. We still have course books. They're still in hard copy. Uh, though we make them available electronically if students want them, we still print those things. We added in teaching days, face-to-face -face teaching days. So in our 200 and 300 level papers, uh, we will travel to Auckland and Wellington, and we will teach for a day in those centres our distant students in that region. Uh, we'll also hold one in Dunedin, where we teach our campus students and the regional distance students in the same room uh, during the evening. And uh, they've been a very effective element of what we've done. Around three quarters of our students attend a teaching day uh, in the paper that they're in. 
That was the figure when we checked, tested the waters back in 2011, and it was the figure when we tested the waters just a few months ago. It has stayed at three quarters. For those students who can't go, the lecturer will provide uh, a podcast summary of what was discussed, what the main issues are. Right. So we added in teaching days, and we added in online discussion. Part of the challenge of this for us was to recognise that computers had been invented, and therefore we maybe should think about using them um, in learning. Right. So we brought in online learning. Another innovation that's not really tied up with a learning model as such was that we began to survey our students each year. So in 2012, we wanted to see how this new model was going. We surveyed our students. And we, it occurred to us, you know, actually it's good to check in with them, find out how we're doing. So we instituted an annual survey. So somewhere in the middle of the year, we'll survey them, get their feedback, all right? And there's, there's one question that from 2013 has been in every survey. This is the first question that we ask them, is how satisfied are you with our program? And if there's another issue on our minds, we'll, we'll ask about that as well. So, you know, at one point we did ask them, do you still want to get course books in hard copy? They told us they did. Um, but basically, in the survey, we ask this question. We say, what's going well? We say, what can we improve or change? And any other thoughts? Right. This is, uh, so I'm going to give you the, the data. Um, and this is, this is just where I'm pleased. And, and where I hope it, I don't seem too pleased, or at least pleased with myself. But I'm very pleased with this. Um, if you look at those figures, I mean, the key one is here, very satisfied, was 42% in 2013, 49, then 64, and 64 this year. There's a neutral response this year. We're talking about 150 individual students in the program. Uh, and, you know, I just, I love that. Um, I think that's great. You know, two... Two-thirds of our students are very satisfied with our program. Um, so, you know, that's great. So then I'm, I'm going to sort of break it down into those other components. And what I'm going to do is just use some of the feedback that the students have given us in, uh, in those surveys to kind of underline what I'm saying about evaluating the program. So if I can think about the, uh, the teaching, oh, not the teaching, guys, that's the next slide. Here's from 2012, right? This is the survey where we really wanted to find out how do you think it's going? How do you think this, this new model is working? And these are the kind of comments we got. So combining the three ways of communicating is an improvement on all previous models. So that was a good start. This covers a wide range of learning methods and keeps the paper very interesting and educational. Right, that was good. Uh, I think it has enriched the distance program and given more opportunities to contact with the teaching staff and other students. And I suppose in that one, I just identify a bit of a theme that I like running through some of these comments, is that sense of contact and, and sense of community and, and belonging to something, um, which I really like. Such an improvement. I think it is an improvement and makes learning more meaningful. I enjoy the blend of learning models as it assists my study and my motivation to stay with it. It is the variety of doing the paper and I, I feel it caters for all sorts of people who learn in different types of learning. And uh, I think that's a useful one because uh, it is the mix of learning that suits the mix of students. Some students are very good at writing essays. Others less so, but it doesn't mean they haven't learnt something. So the online activities in particular, I think, can play to the strengths of, of different students. So it was good for us to bring that in, in terms of meeting the range of learning styles of our students. And here's a final comment, and I think this is, I think this one is my favourite of all the comments and all the surveys that we've done. I like this one the most. I love that distance learning is definitely relational 
and personal now. And uh, you know, I, d I just think that's absolutely brilliant for, for learning, to, for distance learning, for learning at a distance. They live in, I don't know, Whangarei, wherever they are, and I live down here, but they feel that it's relational and personal now. So it, it wasn't quite, but now um, it is. And I think, how did, how did that happen? Um, but I'll go with that. You know, that's, that's, that's superb. I, I think one of the key factors in that is, is the teaching day. Um, we, you know, we, we, will, we weren't sure it would work. Um, it has its challenges. It has its financial challenges. Um, but it does work. So to just look at the teaching day, just to offer you a few comments. It was great to meet other students and get to know the lecturer. The quality of the presentations was first rate. The discussion seemed to flow more naturally and was livelier than in audio conferences. I felt it was a privilege to spend a day experiencing small group interactive learning with people who are experts in their field. So this is in 2012 when we asked a specific question about the teaching day. How, how are you finding it? And I think in 2014 or 15, we also came back in and said, what are you thinking about teaching days? Please, you know, shall we carry on with these? And, and the feedback is consistently like this. Uh, our students love the teaching days. Even our campus students like the teaching days. Because what we do is we, um, we meet our students for the first campus lecture, and then we have no lectures on campus for the first three weeks. And instead, we'll have the Dunedin Teaching Day in week two or week three, and we'll teach the campus students, and we'll teach the distant students in the same room. And the campus students love that. Even they like it, right? So that's, that's worked very well. Uh, I feel that face-to-face -face teaching days are essential to bringing vitality and authentic energy to the class, and they encourage students to really engage. The day closes the distance gap and makes me feel like I'm a real part of Otago University. So again, it's, it's that theme of I feel like I'm a part of something. I, I belong. I belong to the university. That sense of, um, of community. So I like that uh, as well. Um, uh, not unusual. I wish there were two teaching days. Otago is wealthy, so it can afford the cost. Yeah. Uh, but we do get that comment. Students say, there will be several students each year who will say, could we have another teaching day? Uh, could we have more of this? Well, we can't, for all sorts of reasons. But not, not least the relative wealth of Otago University. But uh, it's good that they ask for it. Right? They, they, would, they would like more of this. Online discussion. Well, um, not... Well... This is interesting. So just to throw in a positive, I mean, they've all been positive so far. I'm about to change the pattern. Uh, I found online discussion an excellent mode of assessment since it broadens the skill sets being tested from the more narrow traditional essay-based assessment. So I think that's right. Okay, different learning style might appeal to different students. Appeals to this student. Doesn't appeal to this student. I hate Blackboard uh, and Blackboard assessments, and I'd prefer they did not exist uh, from 2012. Uh, get rid of or seriously modify the assessments structured around online discussion. I find them a complete waste of time as most students appear to have little or no interest in conversation but simply write posts that they know will be able to copy into the final submission. If, if you have got the magic solution to this, we would love to hear it. Uh, how do you facilitate a natural conversation in a very artificial and assessed environment? Uh, and I think that's what the student is picking up on. Um, I, I, I'll, I might talk a little bit about the sort of creative ways around this, but um, this is, I think, the heart of the issue. Um, I, this week I, I sort of checked the course outlines of our 100 level papers. We've got five of them. And I, uh, I, I half expected to find, if I'm honest, that 
there would be little online discussion, on, little online assessment in those papers. Actually, there's only one paper where there's no online assessment. So in four of the five, there is still online discussion. So it appears that we're, is persevering the right word? It's just hard to know how to read this kind of comment. Especially when I give you the one from this year, having said it every year since 2010, I will say it again. Blackboard and Post just don't work. A waste of time with all due respect. So possibly those three comments are from exactly the same student who's been saying this since he or she thinks 2010. Um, right, so anyway, there's, there are students who do not like online discussion. Um, I love online discussion. And partly that's because I teach church history, which lends itself to um, an idea that Rod Sim gave me from some university in Queensland a few years ago. He suggested not online discussion, but online activities and role playing. So, so I've, I've developed these uh, activities where I, I ask my students to speak in the voice of someone from the past in a creative, informal, and kind of fun way. And my thinking is that if they can speak as Gregory the Great, uh, or, or Charlemagne, or Martin Luther, or whoever, then you know, if they can speak in their voice plausibly and credibly, then they've understood something. So in my 200, you mind if I share, in, this two, in my 200 level Reformation paper, uh, I have a, an online activity with 25%. Because over five weeks, we look at the Reformation in five different contexts. Right? In Germany, in Switzerland, the Catholic Reformation, the Radical Reformation, the English and Scottish Reformation. And so what I, what I get the class to do online is to write a story. And I give them, each week I give them the start of the story of two men, Hans and Jacob, uh, who go on a journey from their little village in Germany down to visit their cousin in Switzerland. And they, going on their journey with them is their talking horse called Eric, right? So Eric is this neutral figure who can uh, provide critique and cynicism and sarcasm and just offer comments. And, and, and along the way, other characters come in. So in week two, when we come to the Swiss Reformation, they will meet a couple of characters who are Swiss Reformation characters, right? And they'll start to exchange with each other and then they'll meet a Catholic and that will put the cat among the pigeons, as you'd imagine. And, and so they, they write this story over five weeks and, and it's, it's just, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to mark because it's, it's so funny. I mean, they, they, these students can be very creative and very funny. And I don't know how it comes across to you. It probably sounds really odd. Um, it really works, and they really engage with it. So to my mind, there, there are ways of making online activities, online discussions work. But we, we probably have to be pretty creative about it. That, that would be my suggestion. Um, so it's hard to know how well we've done with online discussion. Um, certainly the feedback is not, is not uniform. So this year, just a few closing comments from, um, this is the last question we ask, any other thoughts? Uh, and, and here's the theme that I've picked up on. I think distance education has improved. I've been studying part-time by distance for the past 10 years. It's good to get emails from the coordinator. So, you know, we, I email them the distance students that started to do that in 2010. It's good to get emails. For me, personal contact with lecturers and other students is vital and adds to a sense of community. So here's a student who's been studying with us for 10 years and has noticed a difference, noticed an improvement in what we're doing, and there's that sense of community and connection. Um, overall, it's been great. Well done. It's a fantastic department, and despite being so far away, I feel very much a part of the Otago community, which is, 
And I think, how did we do that? That is gold, but how did that happen? Um, and I'm not even sure I know the answer. I would suggest that the teaching day is a big part of the answer, except for this last comment. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being able to study theology while living overseas. Right? And the rest of the comment indicates that the student lives in Hong Kong. You guys are awesome. Thank you. And actually, I feel like I'm kind of part of it all, even though I've never even visited the Otago campus. Um, so, you know, I'm, we, we're just very encouraged. Uh, can I say that I didn't consult my colleagues on what I was going to say? So if it has come across as self-serving and cheerleading for ourselves, I apologise. They're not to blame. Um, but five years on from this new model, I'm very happy. Very happy. So, um, any thoughts, questions, challenges? To be happy too, that's great. Questions? Which one? The, the on discussion forums. You know, I mean, the, the way you revised the activity seemed yeah, like a... Well, online, acti uh, online discussion was yeah. new uh -huh. in this new model, and so they are responding to that innovation. <laughs> they still thought it was crap. Yeah. 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 They, did. they didn't Th like Those it. three negative comments came after we introduced it. Wow. Yeah. I'm surprised. So not necessarily the Eric the Horse. No. No. Eric the, Eric the Horse comes off okay. Yeah, Steve from the Advanced School Sciences Academy. I work with high school kids in mm. distance learning. Mm. Um, I'm really intrigued with your use of storytelling in facilitating online discussion. I'm just a little bit curious on, you use that as an assessment tool, you say, for 25%. Yeah. What criteria do you use for a good yep. post, or yep. how do you assess that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So it's 5% it's for each post yep. that they have to make. Um, I give them clear criteria on what I'm looking for. So I break it up and I say, if it's a five, this, is, this is describes what I'm looking for in a five. I usually say, uh, you know, if, if it makes me laugh, you have a good chance of getting a five. Um, <laughs> to encourage humour. I always, there's always had an element of anachronism. So, you know, Jacob has an iPhone. You know, it just, it just gets a bit creative um, and humorous, I think, for them. Um, so I say, here's a five, here's a four, here's a three. Here's a two and a one. Um, no, one no one really gets a two and a one, I have to say. Um, uh, generally, students don't do well at this by not doing it. Um, so I'm, I give some general instructions on what I'm looking for, some general rules of how to engage with this stuff, and then um, students go with that. I should say that in my 100-level paper, I give three options of role plays each time, and one of them is a standard discussion. So students who, who really don't warm to this creative stuff can do a standard discussion if they want. And I had an email from a student in Auckland, one of our distant students, who said, I'm, I'm quite interested in your reformation paper, but I see it's got that 25% creative online activity. How creative is it? Because I'm not sure I really like that. So I said, well, it's quite creative. Because I didn't tell them it had a talking horse, but it, <laughs> you know, that, that's, a, that's an issue. So I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I think I'm clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm quite intrigued with it because <coughs> you're probably aware that storytelling and science communication is very much in vogue at the moment. And we're sort of looking at ways to in better engage our students. Our students are all from rural, small schools, yeah. lower decile schools all around New Zealand. They come for two science camps, one in January and one in July. Yeah. But for the rest of the year, we're using online tools to keep them engaged with the primary goal of enhancing their ability to excel on their final exams. Yeah. And we work closely with, uh, with Wing there and using knowledge building and knowledge forum as an online discussion thing on global science issues. You know, the world's population is about to top nine billion. What is science's role in meeting the energy demands of yeah. that number of people? Yeah. And then you leave it open for them to put posts and we say to them, we want your thoughts to build knowledge yourself. And what we find is, of the 50 or so students, you'll maybe get about 30% who are engaged, and they're engaged, frenzied engagement. The, yeah. <coughs> you'll get one or two, the floaters, the ghost ones, who are reading posts, but not actually posting. And then you've got those who openly admit, um, I'm scared I'll get the answer wrong. Oh. And it's overcoming this hurdle of, 
getting them to realize they're part of a knowledge building community, that it's not like at school there's a right and a wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And of course, education is not like that. Science doesn't work that way. So, um, yeah, well, I'm always looking for new ways to increase that 30% enhanced engagement to something more. And we might try and exploring a story around <laughs> our opening post rather than just an opening question. So, thanks very much. Good. Thank you. Does anybody else want to make? Yes, David. Hi, I'm David Berg from the College of Education. Tim, um, I was just, it sort of follows on really from the last question, but I'm just thinking about how hard you work to sort of go after the lost sheep. If we have a, a theological <laughs> yeah. sort of picture. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, because there's people who choose not to engage, aren't there? There's people who, for whatever life reasons, yeah. aren't there. How hard do you, how hard do you work and, and what do you do to try and sort of bring them in? Well, yeah, that, that's... A that's a very interesting question. Um, I can only answer it personally. I'm not sure what my colleagues might do. Uh, it's not a very theological answer, Dave. Um, to, this is still a university, and it's important to me that students either come to my lectures or they don't. And uh, you know, if I, if I have a student who doesn't show up, I'm not going to go and find them. Um, so uh, I guess a little bit of that translates into the distance environment. Um, I can think of a student who um, gets, literally gets an A plus with every essay. Uh, I've never seen him in a single video conference. Um, but he's, you know, he submits. Um, probably there, there, are, there are triggers. I'm not sure how to say this, but I've just taught an honours paper. That, that had 14 students in it, 13 men and one woman who was of Maori ethnicity. And um, I suppose I was more careful to um, uh, engage with her and, and help her uh, engage with the material and learn. So on the one hand, uh, I'm trying to say I respect this as a university. On the other hand, we are very concerned with pastoral care. Um, in part, that comes down to uh, the nature of who we are in theology. I mean, the fact is, in theology, this is not true of the religion program. I don't want to put them in the same boat as us. Um, but in, in theology, uh, we have been in pastoral ministry. Uh, so there's some, I don't, I'm not even answering your question, Dave. It's, it's somewhere in that space. This, this pastoral concern at the same time as... Paul, do you want to say any more? How much you go searching for the person? Although, I mean, Humanities, of course, has big programs at first year of trying to follow up students after their first assignment or if they haven't got the first yeah. assignment in. So yeah, we're, yeah. we're quite proactive in those first few months across the division, I think, in a very helpful way, and, and we participate fully in that, uh, where students are, just haven't got it in their first assignment shows that, and I think we try to do that quite well. Yeah. But there are points where you simply have to say these are adults, and if they're not doing this stuff, I've tried as much as I can. Yeah. That's where the online activity is a little bit helpful, because it's a small instalment, and if, if, if people don't do it, like, and you know, if they're of Pacific and Maori ethnicity and they've been identified, this is the program that Paul's talking about, then we can respond to that. If, if, someone, if they haven't submitted a first post, that's a signal, right? Something's not quite right. So, but that, that's a sort of divisional approach, really. One last question or comment. Okay, um, Tim, any final word? Can oh. we close it up? Set enough. Enough yeah. time for a Good. clap. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tim.